So, um, got a homework assignment, special homework assignment for you for starters for Wednesday. <laughs> Um, the purpose of the assignment is twofold. One, make sure you know how to use Excel and how to chart things in Excel, which I think most of you have done, but it's always good to have that data. And then also to go to some websites for data. So, um, for Wednesday, I want you all to come. Yeah. Actually, maybe I will just have you, uh, I was going to say with a thumb drive, but why don't I, I'll just have you email it to me before class. So, do uh, by email, uh, 2 p.m. Wednesday. Uh, want you to uh, go to either the FRED data site, FRED, which is the Federal Reserve Board data site that we'll be using, or uh, you could go to some sort of uh, market site for the um, stock market. So stock or bond market site. And I want you to have a time series data of your choosing. Time series, um, at least, at least, uh, oh, at least 12 time periods. At least. So it could be, if you've got monthly data, it could be 12 months worth of data if you're trying to show one month of movement in something. Uh, if it's weekly data, it could be 12 weeks worth of data on something. If it's annual data, it could be 12 years worth of something. I don't care. Just make sure that there's at least uh, 12 time periods, whatever those are. And it's really uh, uh, something of your choice. I'd like you to do... Um, Oh, let's see, probably do three different variables. So if it's something interest rate related, kind of like what we did with the bond market, it could be, you know, multiple products all on the same chart. Um, if you can't do it on the uh, chart, if it's two things like One's a stock price and one's an interest rate or whatever. You can do two graphs. I don't really care, but I want three variables. Okay, any questions? Email the Excel spreadsheet and the Excel spreadsheet only. Uh, you can make comments on the sheet, you know, putting text in it, but I, I don't want it to be like a Word document with an Excel spreadsheet embedded into it. I want it to be Excel only. So uh, make sure that's e emailed to me. And we'll look them over on Wednesday. I will probably, uh, I don't think we'll go through everybody's, but I might randomly select a few of yours to uh, talk about. We'll just pull them up. Sorry, I can't have my mic. Three different variables of what? Your choice. Whatever sounds interesting. Okay. So the, the field's wide open. And I, that's part of what I want you to do, too, is to explore Explore the FRED site, and you'll see that oh, we could be talking inflation and different ways of measuring inflation, or interest rates, or GDP, or um, your choice. And then I didn't want to restrict it to that. FRED has some stock market stuff too, I think, but here you could have Apple stock, or regular bond, or whatever. I don't really care. Like I said, part of it's just kind of exploring what's out there, and then also being able to put data into an Excel spreadsheet, however they provide it to you. Um, some of them will be real easy, like export to Excel. Some of them might take a little bit more work to cut and paste. What I'm not looking for you to do is to, oh crap, they don't have a 
easy function to do, so I'm going to take these 100 data points and manually enter them into Excel. Don't do that. That's not the purpose of the exercise. <laughs> Either A, find another data set, or B, find a simpler way to do it. Because that's the purpose of the exercise, is how to, how to efficiently use data and to get it into a format um, that you use. Okay, anything else there? <laughs> All right. So, chapter two. I'm going to do a little bit of a little bit of back and forth between the overhead and here. So, chapter two. Oh, it's Saturday. It's crazy. All right, so we're going to motivate these financial markets that we're dealing with. And think about what the market does for us in terms of um, going to match up buyers and sellers. Um, without having a, a fully functioning marketplace, we need to have a lot of information. And by the way, with the more sophisticated we get with peer-to-peer -peer trading going on, i.e. Uber, why is Uber peer-to-peer? Peer-to-peer is kind of a fancy word. Peer to peer trading. Uber, technology like Uber helps us do peer to peer trading. Yeah, individual to individual directly, right? So um, prior to Uber coming along, probably the closest thing would be a taxi cab, where you were the buyer, you would call the taxi cab service, and they would decide which driver to send out to you or meet you at a particular time. And so you were really doing business with that company. Whereas it's a little different in that you are being hooked up with a, directly with a supplier. The Uber technology is allowing us to have these uh, transactions on a one-to-one -one basis. It was kind of cool when I went to DC, oh, the Friday before school started. Um, I, I got on, how many of you have used Uber? Okay, about half or so. So I got on my phone, I was at the DC airport and said where I wanted to go. And it said, yep, we got you. Somebody selected it and then quickly uh, an interface said, um, would you like to select the carpooling option? You might save uh, eight to $12. And, it, and it was, I wasn't in that big of a hurry and I like to save money when I can. So I clicked the old, Boop, sure. And then the thing says, okay, great. And we waited a little bit, a little bit of processing time. Good news, uh, Sandy needs to is now been carpooled with you, and your new fare will be nine dollars and twelve cents less than what it was before. It gave me the actual fare amount, and so now I learned that quickly that uh, this Sandy was going to be joining me in the carpool, and she was waiting at the airport too. And it gave me all this information in real time. It said that. Sandy is at the airport also, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but you know, it said, Sandy's at the airport also and has been a carpool with you. So the Uber guy came to pick me up, we drove around to the other terminal and picked up Sandy, we both went up and she got dropped off and then I got dropped off again. All just mapped out through GPS, you know. That technology allowed us to have this ride sharing arrangement um, without having any, um, uh, intermediary between us because Uber is really just helping us set up. It's not a it's not a true intermediary, right? Because the driver got to pick whether they were driving today or they just put their green light on and said, "Yep, I'm in business right now." And so then they're up on the app. If they say some guy wants to be picked up at the airport on their side, they don't have to go pick him up. It's not like their boss told them you have to go to the airport and pick it up. He didn't want to, he doesn't answer it, right? Complete individual freedom on both sides, both the buyer and the seller are being able to uh, do their own thing. 
Um, so that technology allows us this peer-to-peer -peer lending. So that has its uh, benefits, um, but in the lending saver market, that's not quite as easy. If we want to, if there's people who want to borrow money and people who want to save money, uh, having a match come up isn't always as easy of a thing to do because of the paying back of money. It's a lot different than taking a cab somewhere. Uh, we got a lot of things going on with it. So it can be fairly complex. So the idea of direct finance is borrowers borrowing funds directly from lenders in financial markets by selling them securities. So in order to get to this security level, you have to have a certain, uh, a certain credibility ranking, so to speak. Um, and the indirect method that we'll explore in a bit is probably more likely for most companies. All right, so there's some of the benefits there. So let's look at the direct finance method here. So we got lender savers, depending on what type of thing we're looking at, they they're really think they're saving, but they're ultimately lending in the grand scheme of things, right? So lender savers, households, businesses, government, and foreigners. In terms of our uh, big picture, uh, I think we went over at least once in here. Oh, that's right. This is my micro one. I just left this over from last class. Oh, is it my right way? Where's my other? Oh, this is it. I don't have it in there. Okay. Well, never mind that analogy. I guess this is. Well, this is it. <laughs> okay. Uh, this one right here. I was looking for the one step a little bit further, which is the next one after this that has financial markets in it, which is actually a little more appropriate. But in the grand scheme of our plate of spaghetti that we've done that identifies the marketplace, we've got households, businesses, government, the rest of the world, right? And so what this is showing us is that everybody's potentially a lender saver, everybody's potentially a borrower or spender. It's on, 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 we're on most of the both sides of the market. And so the thing, what did it say about the direct finance that was on the couple slides that I started off with? What was the direct finance method? The borrowers going directly to, and then what about it? How, how are they doing it? What was the last part of it? By selling them securities. That's the part that's uh, makes it more direct. So now this is um, some business over here. Maybe it's Mylan. Uh, they've been in the news lately for EpiPen, right? The pharmaceutical company that's anybody with Epi? Anybody carry on the EpiPen? You got one? I didn't have anybody. I was surprised in my micro class, 45 people. So you carry, you've, have you always carried one around pretty regularly? No, I just started two years ago. You just started a couple years ago. Okay. So you know, Mylan is the name of that company, um, and if they want to raise some money, they can sell corporate bonds, the Mylan bond that's an IOU. They'll offer them in financial markets, say, hey, I'm Mylan, I'm really good, I can charge a lot for EpiPens, I'm credible, I'm making lots of money off these EpiPens, trust me, I'll pay you back. All, right, all of that's kind of on the bond in terms of a financial security. And then these guys over here are like, oh yeah, you know what? The government's really in tight with uh, Mylan. They're protected. They're, there's not going to be any competition that we have to worry about, even though they're only selling a drug that has $2 and they're selling it for $600. So since the government has them so well insulated from competition, uh, that sounds like a great bond to buy. And so I can go buy one. Uh, another business can go buy one. Governments can buy one. Any of these guys can go buy that bond. Now, when they actually buy the bond, they're holding a piece of paper from Milan that says, I promise to pay you $10,000, right? That is what they own, and they got it directly from uh, Milan uh, Pharmaceuticals. So that is direct finance. Now, if Milan starts doing some things like bad publicity that their CEO got paid $16 million during their increase, 200, 300% increase in the drug, 
uh, over the last five years, and, and there's been snapshots of the CEO on the beach in, in Mexico with a margarita, and all the while getting favoritism from the government. If all of that kind of blows up in their face, and they start to go south, and they're unable to pay their bonds back, then you're holding the bag. That's it. You've got a claim against their assets if they ultimately go bankrupt. That's superior to the stock market, like we talked about last time. But you are kind of left holding the, the bond that may or may not be paid back. The default risk that you took on. Okay, so that's a, that's a large part of the financial markets. Um, so upstairs, though, is indirect finance. And this is the one that this class, in some ways, focuses in quite a bit on with going to a bank. So now the channel of money looks a little bit different. The household is putting their money into some financial institution, People's Bank here in Ottawa, and that business, Mylan, is maybe getting a loan from People's Bank which probably isn't true. I'm sure they don't bank at People's Bank, but bear with me for a second, right? So if they go get a loan from People's Bank, and I'm the one who put my money in with People's Bank, there's an intermediary in the middle that gives a layer of protection to me, right? So if Mylan goes bankrupt, it's the bank that gets hurt. Not me personally. My savings is still good. Right? So that's indirect finance. In other words, my deposits that I have at the bank are indirectly funding my lens activities over here. Whereas through the direct channels, they've offered that bond, I bought the bond, that's what I'm holding. Okay? Direct finance, indirect finance. All of the lending and saving that's going on is all supporting borrowing funds. Now, I said that the name of the four are here, but what's different about these two lists? If you look at it a little closer, you might not have caught it the first time. What's different about those lists? The order, just the order. In looking at the order, what do you think is significant about that? The, the author did put them in that order for a reason. They didn't just make a typo. Oh, one was four, one was here. They didn't do their cut and paste right. The households go to business firms. Yes. Oh, matching here one to one. Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of what's going on. That's kind of what's going on. That's right. But it's not actually a perfect match right. because then once we go here, it's only right. that are lending to foreigners. That's not the case. But you're on the right track. What's the ordering for? Yeah, they make up the biggest portion of it. So of the lender savers, our focus should be on the household. And this is especially important when we start building models of how the world works. In reality, there's money flowing all directions. But at the end of the day, when all the dust settles, households are the biggest lender saver. And businesses are the biggest borrower spender, right? So you can kind of think of it in the financial markets when I do these simple little abstractions like this, that these are the savers, kind of the net savers, even though at your guys' they well, everybody's got a student loan and the other debts and uh, everybody's a borrower over here. Well, not everybody. It turns out there's enough wealth that households on average are net savers and businesses are net borrowers. And so that's why that list uh, looks the way it does. Notice who's in number two over here. Yeah, that's kind of sad for different reasons, but yes, number two is government, uh, is, is tended to be really worldwide, but especially in the United States, has been a borrower of funds uh, because they don't cut enough, collect the money in taxes to pay for all of the spending that they're doing year by year by year. All right, any last questions or comments on that figure? Okay. Um, so, there 
there's a, uh, I'm trying to decide if I want to, I think I will put this away. For now. All right, so um, the debt market. So the debt market deals with debt instruments. And if we wanted to be real fancy, we could, or uh, not fancy, but a little more specific, we could say financial instruments. Financial instruments, debt instruments. Okay, what sort of debt instruments might we have? What are debt instruments, debt financial instruments? I'm not trying to pull any punches, we just talked about one. Yeah, what kind of loan though? Uh, no, think more for businesses. A bond, right. So the bond is probably the primary debt instrument for larger companies is a bond. So a bond is a financial security with a term and a term face value and coupon payment. And there's a few different, these are like the most generic way. Um, why do I use this word financial security? What makes it, we kind of, well, you know, debt's like an IOU, man, just like grandma loaning you money for college. Well, it's not really, it's a financial security. What makes it different than a grandma loan? What makes a bond a bond in the terms of it being a financial security? What's that? Interest? No. So that's not, it, it does obtain interest, but that's not what differentiates it from grandma. Because grandma can charge you interest too. So just charging interest alone isn't enough. Because it's pooled, not necessarily. What do you mean by pooled? I guess just by, I think I know what you mean, but. Yeah, just multiple bonds. Multiple bonds, oh, yeah. So it's not, it's not necessarily pooled, but you're kind of jumping the gun as another debt instrument where we can pool those things together. But let's, let's just stick with an individual bond. Periodic payments. Periodic payments. We can have periodic payments with grandma. So those are, you guys are identifying term, face value, the payments. So grandma can have all of that too. She could have all three of these, right? Interest rate. The interest rate ends up being kind of a function of the coupon payment. What's different between that Milan bond or a Ford, Ford company bond, Best Buy bond versus the grandma bond? Kind of protected, yeah, there, there's probably assets. I, I thought you were gonna take it a little bit. How else are you kind of, what else does it give you compared to the grandma? It's really grandma who I'm protecting, by the way, not you. So, so let, let's let's make sure we're clear on that on the grandma loan. What the hell is this? Uh, six seconds, everyone. So, um, I owe you, grandma, a thousand dollars, and love, Russ. Okay. So I'm going to go give this to Grandma. Chisholm, you be my grandma for a second. So Grandma's sitting over there holding that baby. How is that different than Grandma? Maybe Grandma's got a portfolio. So now Grandma's got, I won't write on this one, but Grandma's got also a 
a bond from Milan Corporation. She's got both those suckers right there. They're both worth $10,000. Grandma's funded me, $10,000 to go to college. Grandma bought $10,000 worth of Milan bonds. What's the distinction between those two things? Other than risk, let, let's just say, because you guys already brought up risk. That's why I'm saying other than risk. You kind of talked about risk. Yeah. So, yeah. She brings this to Wall Street. How many takers are there going to be? Now, there is such thing as selling bonds at a discount. Okay? So, how much could she get from the investment broker? How much is Goldman Sachs going to give her? By the way, Goldman Sachs probably will give you something. Yeah, maybe six. That's probably a little strong, but yeah. but there is a there is a market price for it, right? I mean, really, somebody they they might want to say, well, who is this McCullough guy? You know, let's just you know start digging into it. But those sorts of deals do actually take place. Um, this is kind of similar to. Uh, are you guys familiar with what a contract for deed is with real estate? Have you ever heard of a contract for deed? It's also called a land contract. Some of your parents might have. Uh, possibly purchased a house on contract. It's either on contract or land contract or contract for deed. Um, it's basically a private loan from the seller to the buyer. And so similar to Chisholm holding on to this piece of junk here, uh, she could possibly sell the terms of the contract to somebody else. And there are brokers who will buy that. I've heard them advertised on TV every once in a while. But it's going to be at a pretty stiff discount. But if grandma needs some money, then she might be willing to dump that piece of paper and sell it to the market and say, sorry, little Tony, I sold your debt instrument. <laughs> you can pay you can pay down, right? So I'm like, Grandma, what do you mean? Did you think I was gonna pay you back? Well, honey, it was just a cash flow problem and I needed to I need to dump you onto somebody else. So then maybe grandma will give you a little a little lesson in, in managing finances. But so this bond is a financial security, meaning that it's marketable, as Joe, you said this, right? So that you could sell it easier, right? So there's no, there's no qualifying, like if, if Chisholm needed to, if Graham to sell this note, they don't have to check into the, to the status if it's the Milan Corporation. Why? Who, who's already kind of checked this out? Who's right, getting? The intermediary? Yeah, the intermediary. And, and in this case, the intermediary and who else has kind of rubber stamped it? The government. That's right. Yeah. So the Securities and Exchange Commission monitors these debt instruments as well as equity instruments. And so they kind of have a government stamp of approval, meaning that if they are in the marketplace and they're calling themselves a bond, a financial security, then they have dotted their I's and crossed their T's and, and provided financial reports. It's a publicly traded company, blah, 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 blah. So they've kind of done the, the credit check, if you will, in that regard. So they don't have all the current financials. That's what's going to allow this thing uh, to fluctuate in price. But in general, you've got um, something that is marketable, a marketable security with the bond. All right, so that's our that's our debt market world that we'll um, deal in. Um, for for these types of inter, uh, markets, investment bankers deal with this. So we got investment banks. I might be jumping the gun here a little bit about uh, both these markets, but um, investment banks are are uh, companies, Goldman Sachs probably being a pretty famous one, that deal in three markets. So they deal in primary markets. And so this is with the initial public offering.
the initial public offering. They're going to help broker this thing. And this might even be in the case of uh, bonds, but certainly in the case of uh, um, uh, equities with stock market. We talked a little bit about this last time, that we've got uh, the initial offering will be kind of bundled up. And so if, if Mylan Corporation is trying to raise a billion dollars, they're not going to try to just say, hey, I wrote up these things and sold them. Uh, they're going to go through an investment bank to do that billion dollar offering of bonds. And they might have a strategy on how they're going to do it, how they're going to be advertised, uh, the pace at which they're put on the market. So they can have a whole bunch of different uh, strategies on doing that. And so the company that helps bundle that package, if you will, when it first goes to market is where investment banks do their work. All right, um, brokers and dealers, brokers and dealers These guys work in secondary markets. And they can, by the way, overlap a little bit. So areas of Goldman Sachs might be doing in secondary markets. In general, uh, these traders are going to be dealing in secondary markets. So what was the deal that we talked about last time with secondary markets? What's the distinction? Money's going from person to person, right? So it's when Chisholm is selling that bond to somebody else, she's going to go through her broker or dealer to raise that money. Rust isn't getting any new money. And that's maybe a bad example since I'm back to the grandma loan to, to Rust. But if this is the Rust Corporation, then Rust got the initial money from Chisholm on the original investment. And maybe Goldman Sachs put that together. So I took my $10,000 and ran, but the bond has a five-year term. So two years into that term, Chisholm can go back to Wall Street and sell this on the open market. When she does that, she's going to go to her uh, broker-dealer, and then maybe it gets sold over here. And then really it's just an exchange of money between these two people, with the broker-dealer kind of making a commission off of the sale. Um, there are circumstances where the brokers or dealers are in the game, so to speak, so that they're kind of working uh, a deal between the second. They might agree to buy a whole bunch of, of stuff from Chisholm because she's pretty loaded and she's wanting to go buy an island in the South Pacific or something. And so she just says, you know what, I don't want to sit here and wait for all this money. I need to close this deal next week. I'm just going to go to my broker and say, hey, well, will you take all these off my hands? I would, I would really like to have $500 million. And they're like, huh. well, the market price is about this. That broker or dealer might just take it off your hands just for kind of a quick side deal and then sell it slowly to the market or take their time with it or whatever. Okay? So all kinds of – anything's really – kind of fair game as long as you're staying within the rules and, and being transparent about it. We can come up with all kinds of different deals. All right, so questions there? All right. Um, so let's look at uh, a little bit more what the pool money like Matt is bringing up here. Um, so we've got money and capital markets. Money and capital markets. So the money markets deal with short term, short term money, short term debt instruments. So if you've got a money market mutual fund, then that deposit that you have 
is all reinvested into these short-term debt instruments. Anybody got what one of the one example of a short-term debt instrument? The CD. What is the CD though? Probably put into. So the the CD the CD is a little bit misleading because the bank has given you that certificate of depression, and then they took your money, and then they actually probably went out into the money market with it. So the CD itself is between you and the bank, is what I'm trying to say, right? And if you go in, you can get it, uh, you can get your money back out. It's not locked down for the three months if it's a three-month CD. Um, you can get it out, but you're going to pay a little penalty. But that penalty and everything is really between you and the bank. So what is the bank probably putting the money into? Short-term debt instruments. Don't expect you all to know this, but I think you've heard of it. If I if I give you the buzzword, you, you'll you'll say, oh yeah, I'm that. Big G, big G, big G. Government bonds, which are called what when they're short term in nature, like three months. Or T bonds, yeah, T bills. So government T bills, which are treasury certificates that are usually three, six month in nature, you know, three to six months. So they're kind of turning over all the time, very low interest, very safe because the government hasn't uh, fully defaulted on anything officially. They've always paid their bills back. And so that is the money market. And so it's, it's uh, pathetic. If some of you do your special exercise over here, uh, you might look at what the T-bill rates have been. Like, kind of interesting for the last year. Actually, that one might be interesting to go back a longer time frame, look back uh, what T-bill rates have been over the last 10 years. Uh, they were quite a bit higher in 2007 than they are today. All right. Um, <clears throat> So when we call them capital markets, the capital market, this is kind of in quotes because we think of money market and the capital market, these are in longer term debt instruments. Usually greater than a year. So it's usually kind of a break point is around then, but longer term debt, longer term debt and equity instruments. So it's just kind of our lingo that we're going to use. When we think about the capital market, we got longer term stuff. Longer term stuff tends to be a little more stable um, with, the, with the volume because the companies are doing a five-year loan this kind of ties it back to economics from finance is that they're usually using that money to buy actual machines or to expand their business. So it's kind of got the purchase of physical capital may or may not be tied into that offering of a 10 year bond or a five year bond because they have a, uh, an expansion or something that they're trying to do. Whereas the money market, this is just parking cash short term. Like, Hey, uh, uh, Sears was in the news over the, uh, last week uh, because they are falling very short. Their cash reserves are really low. Sears is on the way down. Best Buy, on the other hand, was shockingly on the way up. They've been doing pretty good relative to Amazon. I was listening to a little investment podcast recap of the week or something. And uh, so they on the, on the news, they said Sears is very low on cash and cash equivalents. The cash equivalents would be money that they have sitting in money markets. That's really easy to access. Um, so people might be parking money if they're doing uh, uh, international deals with contracts that are coming due. They need to keep a large volume of cash or cash equivalent on hand. In other words, something very liquid. I uh, remember, uh, what's, what's the definition for liquidity that you remember? We haven't gotten to that. We're going to talk more about that next chapter, but liquidity. Yeah, easily uh, transfer. What's easily transfer accessible? So cash is usually the most liquid thing, right? Because people will accept, especially U.S. currency around the world, right? So there's there's kind of a couple of working definitions with with uh, 
uh, liquidity. One is your ability to transform an asset into from one thing into another. So if I own a classic car, a 71 Chevelle SS 354 barrel four speed, that was my first car by the way. Uh, if that's my asset, how quickly can I convert that into something else? Because what I'd really like to buy is a house and I'm going to use my car as the down payment. So how can I transform my car into a house is essentially my question. Is one way to think about liquidity. How quickly can I transform the car into a house? So the other working definition that we have is that it usually is being transferred into cash. How quickly can I sell my car so that I can put my cash into the house, right? So that, that's kind of the two ways to look at it. Usually we think about it being converted into cash. How quickly can we do that? And of course, cash is the most liquid thing. So if you've got cash, you've got uh, high liquidity. All right, so anytime we're trying to keep cash or cash equivalents on hand, we're probably in the money market world. And Sears right now is in, in some trouble. Nobody's, nobody's buying the Sears Robux stuff enough, apparently. So, all right. Um, so let's look at some pictures here. So we got 1980-1990-2000-2010 and we can think about different types of money market instruments. So U.S. Treasury bills, negotiable bank certificates, CDs, large denomination, large denomination is greater than $100,000 value, commercial paper, which is short-term bonds, basically uh, commercial um, companies, and then federal funds and security, uh, these repurchase agreements that we'll talk about later more. So 1980, here's the breakdown of that, and then here's how it's evolved over time. So U.S. T-bills, pretty equal weight, similar weights here. Federal funds, repurchase agreements, repurchase agreements are a new innovation that came around. That's why those accelerated through here. So these areas end up making up this market of fairly short-term, uh, short-term instruments. Capital markets, stocks, let's run down the list here first. We've got stocks, residential mortgages, corporate bonds, U.S. government securities, U.S. government agency securities, state and local governments, bank commercial loans, consumer loans, commercial and farm mortgages. Any surprises up there? What jumps out at you? I know that's a lot of data. That's kind of a little bit, a little bit small. Which one? The U.S. government. Government securities. The U.S. government agencies. Uh, here. Yep. That one's ramped up quite a bit. Mortgages. Mortgages. Do you guys see that back there? You guys got good, good eyes. Kind of a big difference here. We got. 17 to 17, year 2000. So this one went down a little bit. Corporate stocks, the market value of corporate stocks, and then residential mortgages. Big difference. Of course, we have 2007, 2008, the financial crisis is right in between here, right? So we start looking at the makeup of that, and you can see how maybe it's taken a while for um, certain areas to, to recover. Yeah? What is the USA's? Securities like military and like stuff. Uh, no. So the uh, government security. No, it has nothing to do with national security. Oh. No, nope. these are these are just long-term uh, debt instruments by the federal government. So this is these are these are the uh, loans, the IOUs from the federal government. 
And a lot of what the government does is back in our capital market or in the money market, the US T bills. So we've got a large fraction of money that's in the short term category. These T bills are the are the the short term uh, funds. All right, so we got some other definitional things here. So foreign bonds sold in a foreign country and denominated in that country's currency. Sold in a foreign country and denominated in that country's currency. Foreign bonds. Can somebody give me an example of that? So there's regular bonds, but then there's foreign bonds. Bonds that are sold in a foreign country and denominated in that country's currency. Give me an example of maybe a U.S. multinational corporation that might do some foreign bonds too. Apple, Apple okay, how so? Give me an example. I just want specifics. Apple's a possibility. Obviously a global company. Give me an example of Apple with China. Where are your, where are your little iPhones made? China. So give me an example of a foreign, Apple's an American company? God bless America, right? Still, still here, right? So American company has a, primarily all of its phones are made in China. Give me an example of what went on if Apple issued foreign bonds. The currency in China is the yuan, Y-U-A-N. That helps you out. They want to raise some money. Just walk me through it. All I'm trying to get is the, the gist of it here. The yuan, yep. Okay, so they want to raise the equivalent of a million dollars. We look at what the current, the exchange rate is, and so they're going to sell bonds that are going to be written out in yuan. So instead of it being a $10 million bond, $10 million, I mean real literal dollars, it's going to be a 10 million yuan bond. Love Steve Jobs, even though he's dead. This was an old one. That this was a 10-year corporate bond, foreign bond that he did, right? So the bond is actually expressed in yuan. Why would they do that? Why would it matter? Why not just put it in dollars? They're, they currently have other bonds that they, that they issue in dollars. Why would they put it in yuan? Okay, good. What else? Easy to use. Easy to use by who? Uh, if you're trying to build a facility in China, it's easy to use there. You don't have to transfer, right? So there's no exchange rate risk, right? So imagine that you're Apple trying to build another factory in China. You need yuan to do that. There's an argument to be made that maybe it's better to sell bonds to Chinese people with yuan already. I get it, and then I build my factory using those funds, right? And I'm completely eliminating exchange rate risk. Instead of selling them and getting dollars that I then have to trade over to yuan, I've got it all done. It's all in yuan already. So those are foreign bonds. Euro bonds. Bond is denominated in a currency other than that of the country in which it is sold. Other than in which the country it is sold. Euro bonds. Since we're running a little low on time, what if I'm Apple, I'm in the United States, I go to Wall Street and say that I want to sell some bonds that are expressed in euro dollars. Like literally the euro, the euro from Europe, right? So now I'm going to attract investors. The money's going to be in the United States, but denominated in euros, right? So we're not in Europe doing it, but we're selling it and expressing it in dollars there. Currencies, foreign currencies deposited in banks outside the home country. So what if I have money that I raised from Wall Street in Germany and I put it into the German bank? The German bank now has U.S. dollars in there. That's a foreign currency 
it, it was happening a lot with Europe, so we get this euro term on there, but it's actually true no matter what country it's in. So euro currencies. All right, so that looks like a good spot to cut off. We'll see you on Wednesday. Remember your homework exercises. Emails back. Thank <laughs> you.